All right, it is two o'clock, so let's go ahead and get started. Our colloquium speaker today is Varese. Varese did grad school and undergrad at Cape Town in South Africa. Uh, she was a um, employee here for two years after that, at which point now she is working back at Meerkat and is going to tell us about the Meerkat radio telescope. So please join me in welcoming Varese. Introduction. So, um, as Dr. Butterfield said, that I will be talking to you guys today about the Meerkat Radio Telescope, which is a newly constructed radio telescope in South Africa. So, I'd like to start the presentation by just giving a quick overview. Firstly, I'll talk about like why did the telescope get the name Meerkat, and then I'll go on to where is Meerkat located. We'll look at uh, what constitutes the Meerkat radio telescope, and then we'll look under the hood to see how Meerkat actually processes the data from space. And then we'll look at some science with Meerkat. So, why Meerkat? So, originally the telescope was going to be called the Karoo Array Telescope, and that stands for CAT. Um, but then it got extended, so originally there was only going to be 20, and then it got extended to 64, so then they called it Mir Cat, which translates, in Af so in Afrikaans, Mir means more, so it translates into more cats. But <laughs> at the same time, it's a very, very cute uh, mammal called the Mir Cat that you can find around site and other places in South Africa as well. And you guys can try and pronounce that um, scientific names, I definitely can't, like Suricata, Suricata. <laughs> yeah. So where is the Meerkat radio telescope? In short, it's in, in the middle of the Karoo Desert in South Africa, which is a place with stunning sunsets. So as you can see in this photo, it's spectacular sunsets. But also, Google knows where Meerkat is. <laughs> um, and this is a map of, sub, uh, of the southern part of Africa. And this is an outline of South Africa. And this red marker is where the Meerkat radio telescope is located. So the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory actually consists of multiple sites of which Meerkat is located there. And it's also located in a radio quiet zone, which has a radius of about 70 kilometers around the core of the Meerkat radio telescope. And right here at the edge of the radio quiet zone lies a small town of Carnarfon, which we have as a Sereo offices. We also have offices in Cape Town, and that is where I am based. This is also where the main Meerkat control room is located. However, there is a small operations control room at site as well. Then up in Johannesburg, which is close to Pretoria, um, we have the Hartebius Hook radio telescope. And that is the telescope that was built way back in the 60s by NASA, and it was used as a communication downlink station for the Apollo 11 mission. And um, so the Hartebius Hook Radio Telescope also now forms part of the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory. And there's offices in Johannesburg as well. So if we zoom in a little bit more, we can actually see what the site looks like. But you guys can see that this is an outdated satellite image because there's no dishes actually up there. Um, However, you can see the locations of the individual Meerkat uh, dishes. So over here is the core of the Meerkat telescope. It's an area with a diameter of one kilometer. And there are 64 antennas, and 75% of the Meerkat dishes are located within this one, one kilometer diameter. So that's 48 of the dishes. Also in this picture, you can see the CAT-7 precursor radio telescope. Well, you can see the location to the 
of the CAT-7 radio telescope, which is the precursor to the Meerkat radio telescope. From CAT-7, there is a road that goes up to this circular area, which you guys can see, and that's the location of the HERA radio telescope. This is a road that comes in from Karnafan, and this is the Losberg site facilities. It was named after the Losberg. So this is this <coughs> is called Losberg, and we'll look at the Losberg facilities a bit, a bit later during the talk. A baseline is defined as the distance between two of the dishes, and Meerkat has a maximum baseline of eight kilometers. So that means that the furthest distance between any two points of a meerkat, between any two meerkat dishes is eight kilometers. So just as a side note, and in case you guys were wondering what these other telescopes that I've been mentioning looks like, this is the CAT-7 precursor to meerkat. And down here we have the Huckabee's Hook radio telescope which is situated, so this is the telescope that was used uh, during the Apollo mission. This smaller telescope over here is actually the precursor to the CAT-7, which is again the precursor to Meerkat, um, which you can see here in the distance of the hydrogenic cock of reionization, the HERA array. And the reason why I really want to show you guys this, as I'm sure you know, is, is that the HERA prototype was built out here in Green Bank. So what is Meerkat? Meerkat is an interferometer, and that means that it is individual radio telescopes that gets combined in order to form a larger dish. Meerkat is also a Gregorian offset antenna. So here you can see the main dish. The main dish has a diameter of 13.5 meters. It has a pedestal. It has a sub-reflector and it has a feed indexer. So the astronomical sources comes from space, goes to the main reflector, gets reflected to the sub-reflector and then to the feed. The slew rate and the azimuth of um, in the azimuth direction for Meerkat is two degrees per second, and it can turn, so it's like zero is an in morph, and then it can go to negative 180 and then to positive 275 degrees. It can, the slew rate in elevation is one degree per second, and it can go all the way down to 15 degrees and then all the way up to 88 degrees. Each antenna is about 19.5 meters tall and weighs 42 tons. So the rotating turret has four receiver slots. L-band has been fully installed and is um, operational. <coughs> UHF band, all the receivers have been fitted and 58 of the digitizers has been shipped to site and like the installation process is ongoing and the S-band receiver is also Deployment of the S-band receiver is also underway. We are also exploring X-band in the future, but it's not in the budget for this financial year. So, all of the radio frequency, yeah, all the RF signals are sampled at the feed, and this is a zoom in of what the feed ind indexer looks over here. So, the, these are the receivers. The, uh, the job of the receiver is to take the, or is to collect the radio signal and convert it into an electrical signal, which is an analog signal, and that analog signal gets sent over a coaxial cable to the digitizer, which is the unit that is responsible for converting that RF signal into a digital signal. The pointing accuracy of the Meerkat is 25 arc seconds and the base pointing accuracy is five arc seconds. The total collecting area of Meerkat, so let's do that calculation, so it's 13.5 meter for one telescope, that gives you 143 meters for um, area for one telescope, and then that times 64 is approximately 
9,164 square meters for the entire array. Construction of Meerkat began in March 2014, and the telescope was inaugurated in July 2018. Each of the dishes were assembled on site, so they couldn't be shipped as they are. Um, there's a shape that I will show you guys a bit later. Each dish consists of 40 aluminium plates and they're um, fitted onto a steel framework. Once the dishes have been assembled, they get transported on this abnormally large truck to where the Neopet <laughs> is located and then it had to be wasted using a crane. So this is the Losbach site facilities. Over here you can see the shed in which the panels were assembled. I actually got to see the very last dish being assembled. I was on site during that time. And it was very exciting to see the last Meerkat dish being assembled. This is the diesel tanks on site, and this is um, staff facility, housing containers. And this over here is the Peru Array Processing Building, which is the Faraday cage that houses all the electronics on site. During the inauguration, there was a small model of what the interior of the KAP the shielding room looks like. So you can see the honeycomb structure over here. This building is also built into the ground. So it's an approximately one story level into the ground. And you can't see it in this picture, but there's a like heap of ground that also provides another 20 dB of shielding from any, for the telescope. So next, now we can go to the next section and we can look under the hood of how Meerkat actually processes the data. And in this section, we will look at, we'll give a system overview. We will look at the L and the UHF band receivers. We will look at the time and frequency reference system. And we will look at the digitizer units. And then we will look at the correlator beam former. So this block diagram gives an architectural overview of the telescope. You've got 64 inputs and you can select, so this is on one antenna. So you've got the receivers and you've got the digitizers and you can select either UHF, L or S band. This goes after it's being digitized, it gets converted into an optical signal, also in the digitizer unit, and that goes to the receptor switch. The receptor switch then goes to the fiber patch, and this is where the signal gets transported to the Peru Array processing building via fiber, which is buried one meter under the ground for temperature stability. Once the signal gets to the Peru Array processing building, all the data gets plugged into a 40 gigabit Ethernet switch. An F engine is the fast Fourier transform. This is the unit that channelizes the data into different frequency components. The X slash B engine, those could, like an X engine is the correlator, and the B is the beam former. There's also user-supplied equipment, and user-supplied equipment can easily integrate with Meerkat because we make use of multicasting. The following data streams are also available for the user-supplied equipment to subscribe to. So if you've got used equipment, it can subscribe to the raw data coming from the digitizers. It can also subscribe to the F like it doesn't have to subscribe to the digitizer, it can decide to like take the data from the F engine, or if it wants to use the data from the X or the B engine, it can subscribe to that data. The data products from each of these processing nodes are packetized as speed uh, streams. Speed is the streaming protocol for exchanging astronomical data. And now that we've looked at an overview of the system, 
we can go have a little better look at the different subsystems. So this is what the L band, this is an L band receiver, and this is what it looks like in the lab. It's got its protective dome removed here. Um, and this is the front view, and that is the back view. These circles are called concentric um, choke rings, and they form part of the waveguide of the receiver. If you add or remove some of these, the, you actually change the beam pattern of it. And the dipoles, which you guys can see in these pictures, they actually sit right behind the feed. Um, so this is the part that picks up the signal from space. Meerkat has been optimized for having a low side lobe level. So when you look at the radiation pattern of uh, any antenna, you know, it will have side lobes. You will have your main lobe and then you've got your side lobes. And the relative difference between the main lobe and the second main lobe of the L-band receivers is 26 dB. The bandwidth of the UHF band receiver is 580 to 1010 megahertz. And for the L-band receiver, it's 900 to 1,670 megahertz. Did I get that right? So I said UHF band first, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay, here is a block diagram of the L band receiver. So you can see the dipoles and the ONT, and you've got vertical polarization going to one low noise amplifier, and you've got horizontal polarization going to another low noise amplifier. The, receiver, the receivers make use of two-stage two stage, um, cooling. This part is kept at 20 Kelvin, and the second stage is like room temperature. The calibration source sits in the second stage, and that is a noise dive, and the noise dive gets controlled by the digitizer. So this graph shows the receiver temperatures, noise temperatures. So this graph is like measures from the lab. The system noise temperatures when the antenna is fitted onto the telescope is 22.5. So for each polarization and their combined average, the system noise temperature has been measured. So next I would like to tell you guys a little bit more about the time and frequency reference subsystem. So <coughs> this is the subsystem that provides timing to the telescope and it also provides the pulse per second for the telescope. So we have two hydrogen major, masers provided by T4 Science, and the time and frequency reference group consists of the uh, Karua ray timing system, the sample clock generator, and the pulse per second um, transmitter. So the there's also a timing master controller, and the timing master controller is in charge of calculating KTT, which is the Karoo Array um, Telescope Timing. Yeah, um, Karoo Telescope Time. The CATS system is the system that's responsible for measuring the round trip delay to the antennas and to accurately timestamp the data. So there is a signal that gets sent from the KAPB building to the antenna, and then it gets reflected back. And that offset is measured, and then used to time accurately timestamp the data products. The hardware that gets used in the time and frequency reference subsystem is the two hydrogen masers. Then we have uh, Septon Trio GNSS receivers connected to the masers. Um, and we also have two rubidium standard GPS clocks. And all of these clocks get combined in order to form KTT. 
Um, so next up, I've got the UHF and L band digitizer. So this specific picture is of a UHF band digitizer. <coughs> Um, and I would just like to remind you guys that at this point, the signal coming in is still an RF signal. So over here you guys can see the SMA connectors and this is the connector for the optic fiber. Because the digitizer units sit right up at the telescope, we really needed to make sure that it doesn't emit any RFI. So all the electronics is inside an RFI shielded box. And in turn, these RFI shielded boxes in an RFI shielded box. <laughs> um, so, I need to get this right. So over here is the RFCU, that is the radio frequency conditioning unit. That's the unit that contains the anti-aliasing filters. And these filters are important because Meerkat makes use of bandpass sampling. <coughs> So the anti-aliasing filters need to have nice and sharp edges so that none of the <coughs> none other gets none other interference gets sampled down into baseband. So that's the use of the anti-aliasing filters. So we've got an RFCU for the H polarization and B polarization. Then we have two sampler units. So those are where the ABCs are actually located. And you can see the fiber units go, coming out here to what is called the D engine. And this is the unit that packetizes the data, which takes the optics um, data and packetizes it into the speed format. And then at this point, it's 10 gigabits per second Ethernet times 4 that goes into the antenna pedestal. And then from the antenna pedestal, it's a 40 gigabit Ethernet link that goes to the Karu Array Processing Building. So data rates, um, it's 10 bits times two polarization, and we sample at 1,712 mega samples per second. So that produces 34,240 gigabits per second per antenna. So that's the digitizers. Let me just make sure that I said everything that I wanted to. Um, for the electronics group, the digitizer unit is fitted with a Kintex 7 FPGA. So next up, I just want to give a quick overview of our correlator beamformer architecture. This block diagram shows the interface between the digitizers and the processing nodes. So, for Meerkat, the processing nodes are Scarab boards, and Scarab boards are FPGA boards. And recall from the previous slide, I said that there is 34,420 gigabits per second from each antenna. So times that times 64, it produces 2.2 terabits per second. And all of that data gets plugged into multicasting switches. So there's multiple switches which this data plugs into. So the processing nodes, they can, um, are scarabs, and a scarab can be configured to be either an F engine or an X engine or a B engine, and it can make it can do this because of the field programmable gate array FPGA technology. Uh, Scarab is fitted with a Vertex 7 FPGA, and this is a picture of the Scarab boards. And yeah, it's like so the FPGA is underneath the fan. So for the F engine, there are three frequency granularizations that Meerkat currently implements. There is the 1K mode, the 4K mode, and then the 32K mode. And Meerkat can also form subarrays. So this means that you can form, you can split the 64 antennas into different subarrays. You can have for example, one 16 antenna array doing holography, 
and another 16 array doing software tests, and then other 32 being used in 32K mode. So over here, this is a picture of what the Peru array processing building looks like on the inside, and you can see the scarab racks uh, over here. In total, there are 288 uh, scarab boards. We have 54 Mellanox switches. Each of the Mellanox switch has 12 40 gigabit Ethernet ports. So next up, science with Meerkat. So Meerkat has many large scale, large survey projects, and I'll only be covering a few. We also have telescope open time, and we've received about 25 proposals this far. And in this section, I will be talking about the UV coverage for Meerkat. I will talk about some science projects for Meerkat. I'll talk about Meer time, and I'll talk, give an overview of a recent discovery that was made with Meerkat. I'm just going to grab a bit of water. Any questions so far? Are we doing questions afterwards? Yes, Paul. Are we doing questions afterwards? Um, how would you guys want to do it? Afterwards? Is that your question? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, maybe I should finish up the science and then do we do questions afterwards? How does that sound? Very good. Okay. So, an interferometer like Meerkat has a synthetic aperture. And this synthetic aperture is called UV coverage, so UV. Um, the UV coverage is dependent on the number of antennas in the array, the um, configuration of the array, the frequency that you're observing at, the declination of the source, and the length of your observations. So remember, like at the beginning of the talk, I s talked about baselines and how a baseline is the distance between any two teles telescopes, well, any two antennas in the telescope. So for each baseline, at a specific point in time, you get a one sample on the UV coverage plane. And Meerkat had the calculation for the amount of baselines is n times n minus 1 divided by 2. So for Meerkat, that is 2016 baselines. So that is 2016 points on the UV plane. And then as you <coughs> observe for longer, it creates these tracks. So this is for an observation of eight hours long with a source declination of negative 30 degrees. So science with Meerkat. We, as I mentioned, we have a lot of large survey projects of which Thundercat, Trappen, Breakthrough Listen are, is a few. Meerlift is not Meerkat science, but I'll t tell you guys a little bit about Meerlift and you will see shortly why. But let's start with Thundercat. Thundercat is the hunt for dynamic and explosive radio transients with Meerkat. They study high energy astrophysical processes which emit radio transients in radio bursts. So amongst other sciences that they are wanting to explore, here's just a few that Thundercat wants to explore. It's um, galactic jets from accreting objects. They are looking for radio counterparts to X-ray binaries. And they're also looking at supernova and gamma ray bursts. Then TRAPM. TRAPM is the transients and pulsars with Meerkat. The TRAPM group has installed multiple CPU GPUs in the KEB building, and this system can form up to 400 beams on the sky. Uh, amongst other sciences, what they are looking at is, is they are looking for pulsars and transients in supernova explosions, also wind nebula and firm Fermi gamma ray bursts. They are searching for pulsars in globular clusters and they're looking for pulsars outside of our galaxy and they are looking for exotic binary pulsar systems. 
Breakthrough Listen uses Meerkat in commensal mode, and they've recently installed all the Breakthrough Listen user supplied equipment in the Karoo Array Processing Building. Breakthrough Listen is running the largest survey in the world to look for life outside of our like, planet, and they also make use of the GBT in order to conduct this survey. So Mirdef, Mirdef, I wanted to talk to you guys about because it's an it's a optical telescope that was constructed by the South African Astronomy Observatory, our sister organization. It is located about 250 kilometers away from Meerkat, and it will track whatever Meerkat is looking at. So whenever there is a transient, and when it's nighttime, and the transient was discovered by Meerkat, we could see what the optic equivalent of that looks like. It's a 0.6 meter telescope. Mere time. So, mere time means I need more time. <laughs> um, mere time is a project, and it's the key pulsar timing project for Meerkat. And these are just some um, exciting results from recent mere time observation runs that happened. But mere time has various science cases as well. It has the timing of a thousand pulsars per observation. It's timing pulsars that's found in globular clusters. It's using pulsars in a pulsar timing array in order to try and establish what the gravitational wave background noise looks like and gravitational waves that can be, that can be detected by pulsar timing arrays <coughs> are in the order of microhertz to nanohertz. There are also timing binary pulsars, which this is an example of a binary pulsar that was timed. Um, so on the left, you've got J1644 <coughs> minus 4559. Um, so you can see the sharp profile of, pulse, of the pulsar. And on the right, you've got the binary pulsar, which is J1757 minus 5322. Now, for the recent discovery um, that was published in the Astronomy and Astrophysics Manuscript of July this year, Sarah et al. found neutral hydrogen gas within and around Fornax A whilst working on their large scale survey project titled A Meerkat Survey, H1 Survey for Fornax. So they found neutral hydrogen gas, which are <coughs> these green blobs on this picture. And these arcs are just shown to aid the eye so that you can see the hydrogen tail. <coughs> this image is a optic overlay, so the green blobs is the radio image and the image in the back is the optic image that was created by the Fornax Deep, Deep Survey using the Omega Cam on VST. So VST is the VLT Survey Telescope at Peronal Observatory in Chile. The paper is titled Neutral Hydrogen Gas Within and Around NGC 1316. And I have that paper if you guys want to read it, if anybody is interested. And lastly, here is an image of the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way, that was revealed at the inauguration in 2018. This image is a two by one degree portion of our sky and it corresponds to an area of approximately 1,000 by 500 light years. The image shows star forming regions, remnants of supernova explosions, and radio filaments. This white part over here is the galactic center. This image was created by data taken from Meerkat as well as the GBT, and they were combined in a process called feathering. The red part is the lower, is the not, uh, no, you can't say not so bright, but like it's the yellow ones are brighter and then the white part is the absolute brightest objects in this image. 
And I would just like to take this opportunity to also thank Dr. Armantrout and Dr. Butterfield for organizing this colloquium, and Thomas Chamberlain for hosting me, and everybody else who made this trip possible. Thank you very much. Could you talk a little bit about what your role is in all of this? Sure. Let <laughs> me um, grab some water. Um, so I'll use the slides to do that. Okay, well, I've worked on the Digitizer Master Controller, which is the software that communicates and controls the digitizer units. So back when I started at Meerkat, that was like one of the first things that I got to work on. And um, that entailed writing sensors to monitor, for example, this, the temperature, as well as um, the speed protocol that I mentioned to you guys about, um, the digitizer sends speed packets over the optic fiber. So I wrote um, some of the speed code that is implemented for the digitizer master controller. At the moment, I am working on the TMC, which is the timing master controller. I'm working on software that combines the different hardware to produce KTT to UTC offset. Like currently we are packing to GNSS, like, but um, the goal from Meerkat is to be able to track the timestamps to UTC. And that's the software that I'm currently working on. Yes. So your multicast switch, uh, I think you said, is somewhere around 2.1 terabytes of data that it's processing before it multicasts? Um, so it, the, the multicast switches, there are 54 of them, and they just kind of root the data. So they don't do any of the processing. Right. Yeah, so the 2.2 terabytes that's coming from the telescope is not actually all on one link. That's just the total of all right. the different ones. Yeah. So those multicast switches, did yes. you commercially buy them? Yes. or they're me Mellanox switches. Uh -huh. Thank you. Uh, Paul, you had a question? Yeah, the, um, the data from earlier, you mentioned FPGAs, is that, um, are you also using any CPU or GPUs? Or? Um, so the Meerkat correlator beam former doesn't specifically make use of CPU, GPUs. That is all Scarab based, which is FPGA based. Um, and it internally has a micro based CPU for control. So, which is called like a soft core. Does that answer? Yes. Cool. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Ed McCauley. I was one of the original folks at Xilinx. Oh, so cool. I appreciate you using all the Xilinx tools. <laughs> 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 um, my hobby interest through SAR is uh, Earth rotation aperture synthesis. Okay. So I'm curious about the a couple points of your your, your, your early block diagram. It looked like you could do correlation in both the time and frequency domains. Is that correct? Um. We don't do any correlation in the time domain as far as I understand. So as far as I understand that the correlator subscribes to the F engine data, so that's in the frequency domain. But in theory, that is true, and we have user-supplied equipment that do subscribe to the timing data, and then on CPU, GPU, do their own analysis. Since you're part of the timing uh, uh, creation or orchestration, with what resolution are you injecting your timestamps? You know, how many you know, nanoseconds, nanoseconds, how accurate are your timestamps? Um, the specification you, is, I think, to have been, so the uncertainty with which KTT to UTC is, is five nanoseconds, but that is not implemented yet, like because I'm still working on it. <laughs> and like it's still in progress. Yeah. But like I think at the moment it's to within a hundred nanoseconds. Oh. Yeah. 
but it, it needs to be better. <laughs> well, what, what is the resolution of the time stamps relative to your local standard? Uh, I don't know if I understand the question, sorry. Irrespective of, of what, how close the local standard is to the rest of the world, when yes. you time stamp, when you've got a digital stream coming up, yes. how precisely can you say it was sampled? Yeah, so it's supposed to be within 100 nanoseconds of, U 5 nanoseconds of UTC, the uncertainty on that. That sounds awfully gross. But the currently, I think you're talking about the skew between the various sampling points, not between absolute time, but between all the different radio telescopes. You have to have some time accuracy between them, and it doesn't. You don't care where they are relative to UTC within yeah. reason, but within each other, they need to be very, very close. Do you, what is that number? I think it's what they want to know. Oh, okay. I think if I understand the question correctly now that's what the cat system is supposed to be doing um so it measures the round trip delay and then we i don't know the number it's like i don't have a number for you but uh, well let, let me put it a, a different way yeah when you generate a, a packet of sample data mm -hmm. you've got some metadata that says it occurred at such and such yeah. a time what is the least significant bit of that metadata in time. I don't know. <laughs> um, like it, it's, used, it's like a 64 bit timestamp? Yeah. But what is the rate of that timestamp? Oh, the rate of the data going through. Uh, Maybe we can take it offline and draw some sure. pictures and stuff. Sure. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, and maybe you can sit in because I. Sorry, I don't Thanks, Grace. And maybe I don't know the answer. <laughs> yeah. Hey, um, I'm just curious about any other uh, science results that you may have heard about. Uh, with regards to like, the FRP survey, Pulsar survey, um, is there anything about the status of that? Um, so, near time is up and running about. So when I was at the ICTA, there was about 13 successful near time runs that has occurred. By now, it's probably like 15 or something more. Um, so that's the ongoing process. And the, I can show you the images again. And, yeah, but like, I don't know if there's any new papers that has been published. Yeah. Yeah. You said that there were something like 25 proposals in. What does the proposal process look like for Meerkat? I don't Do you know. know? Okay. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so those 25 proposals that I mentioned, they were the open time proposals. For the large survey proposals, there were more. I, I don't know how many there were. Yeah, sorry. Um, I can put you in touch with somebody that would know how the proposal works. <clears throat> Um, so, as you're very well aware, uh, in Green Bank we have um, a beam forming receiver that is uh, also sending raw digitized data over fiber. And we've had some issues with that process. Do you guys, is it a similar process for Meerkat or is it? Is the digitization? Are um, you having to recover, you know, the bite lock and no, things like so that? No, so it's a different um, process. Different. Yeah, okay. we packetize the data at the digitizer. Okay, so it's actually packets over the fiber. Yeah, ah, yeah. So okay. it's a. I don't think I ever said this, but yeah, it's a. It's an IF signal that goes over the fiber. Um, yeah. But those packets have a header yes. that has all sorts of interesting information. Yes. So it's a, it's that's a, what I'm trying to nail you on. But I'll do that later. Yeah, we can. Like, I would love to chat to you more about it because, like, I mean, I'm, I could. And if I don't know the answer, I can definitely point you to somebody who would have the answer. Yeah. Yes. Hey, could you comment briefly? I know we're running out of time here, but uh, on your breakthrough listen, could you comment on the general strategy of that that portion of the project? 
Um, so the way that I understand that Breakthrough Lesson works with Meerkat is, is that it plugs into this switch. Uh, I think this would be a, a better picture to have up here. So basically this use equipment, the user supplied equipment, um, that is basically one of those machines would be Breakthrough Listen. Well, not one, they've got multiple <laughs> CPU, GPU processors, but it plugs into the 40 gig switch and then it can subscribe to any of the data products. And I think that they observe while other observations are also taking place. So they benefit from other science. So they can use that, they can also subscribe to the data and then the data gets routed to their machines, even though it's not their dedicated session. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's good enough, thank you. Okay. Um, Dave McMahon is around. <laughs> you, you should speak to him. <laughs> he will be able to tell you much more than I can. I am interested in hearing about your quiet zone. Mm -hmm. So the quiet zone is, has a radius of 70 kilometers from um, the core. It's about 15,000 square kilometers. Um, we also have, make use of the f different tiers. You know, like once you get into this zone, there's no more reception. Once you get into this zone, uh, you should switch off your phones. So it's very similar to what the GBT and GBO makes use of. But other than that, I can't tell you much more. But I can definitely put you in touch with people. Yeah. Like we had this brochure that explained um, about the law that was enacted. I'll try and find that and then send it to so you. So it's a federal law? Yeah. So how many people got caught? In... <laughs> um, in the radio quiet zone, there's like nobody. <laughs> like it's, it's a very. It's, it's a, quiet. Yeah, there's not a lot of people there. It's quiet because nobody wants to live there. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's a very. It can be a very harsh environment. Like in the winter, it gets really, really cold, and then in the summer, it gets really, really hot. Yeah. So you're not dealing with civilians complaining? Oh, they always complain. <laughs> so, um, I think some people think that it's our fault that they don't get Wi-Fi in their town, but like they wouldn't have had it in either way because it's not like we took anything away. Yeah. Yeah. Bob and I were wondering what the most dangerous animal. Is. <laughs> <laughs> a meerkat. Um, yeah, a meerkat. Yeah, snakes. Actually, we said snakes. We get like other. Um, yeah, there was a there was a poof a puff adder um, in one of the. I don't know how it got in there, but like in one of the like, like pedestals, like in one of the meetings that we had. Where's yeah? Where's the picture of it? Yeah. So in when like somebody opened up like there's a door at the pedestal, and when somebody had opened it up, there was like a puff adder there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any final questions for our speakers? Um, you mentioned that there's a control room in Cape Town, and yeah. I wondered how the data is gets there. So it's, there's a fiber link from, All the, way from the site. Well, there's breakpoints at different places. Um, but yeah, it's, it's over or like a high speed fiber. So you and all the data goes to Cape Town. Is it fiber that was already there, or did the observatory have to lay it? I think the observatory had to lay it, but I would need to fact check that. <laughs> well, definitely like on site, like the fiber had to be laid, but like the link from Karnoff one to Cape Town, I'm pretty sure had to be laid. <laughs> but um, yeah, I can't say that for certainty. <laughs> If you're done with the technical discussion, can you go back to your Google Maps slide? I'm curious as to what those big brown things were about. Yeah. Other Those things. What is that? Um, oh, wait. Uh, these things? Yeah. They, those are mountains. I actually like, climbed this mountain and ran all the way over here. This is about like 
10 kilometers. So, yeah, so you go up this mountain and then you can run all the way across and then along to antenna number 63 and then there's a road that goes over there. And then these are also mountains. So they're all really flat. So in this picture you can actually see a bit better what they look like from the front. So that was a top view and this is like a side view. Yeah, side view. Yeah. So what cut the tops off? <laughs> the Lorax. <laughs> The Karuka to um, originate. There are some volcanic rocks now that you mentioned it that some people have like explored, but I don't know the complete formation of it. Yeah. Um, all right, any last questions for our speaker? All right, let's see.